All right, here we go. Looking at placing concrete in today. Uh, placing concrete, sorry. This lesson, um, this is obviously the theory associated with, we're not placing the concrete in here during the video. But you're gonna know the steps that we go through for the planning and placement of concrete. You're gonna learn a little bit about the finishing technique and some of the defects that are caused during the process of um, the slab being placed. We're also gonna talk about control joints and I hope you understand how joints are used to control the damage um, that can be caused to concrete slabs and the buildings around them. And again, time for you to update that JSA documentation to have really specific detail about the steps in the concrete placement process, the specific hazards, specific tools, specific machinery that are being used along that way. To get started, there is a video for placing the concrete slab. Again, pause this lecture, go watch that video, I've shared the link with you, and come on back when you're done. All right, so you've, you've gone and watched the video on placing, um, placing the concrete slab, okay, and all of the process around getting that concrete in there and what we need to consider. So we then need to think about concrete joints. Again, I've got another video here for you to watch. Um, go off and watch it and come back. See you in a minute. All right, so you're back now. You've watched this concrete joint uh, video. You will recall in that video, there are, there are three main joints that we talk about. The expansion joints, the dowel joints, and then the uh, control joints. The expansion joint, if you remember, needs to account for the fact that concrete grows and therefore will push, if you have concrete touching this brick wall, will push against it, causing the brick wall to either push over or to be damaged and cracking the bricks to fall out. We don't want that, so we place we place the expansion join material in there. Now, um, in really simple applications, we just use a foam strip, which compresses when the slab expands, and when the slab contracts again during its, uh, during its um, growth processes, it then expands back out again. Okay, so we've got that foam layer to help us with the expansion join. The control join is basically where we say, look, slabs crack. They crack because they are pulled apart, there might be tree roots coming up underneath them, whatever it might be, it happens. So let's try and control where it cracks by putting a control joint in. This is where we put a groove, a straight groove along the middle of our slab, which is intentionally placing a small weakness in the slab so that when the slab is placed under pressure and needs to crack, maybe it's because a tree root has come up underneath it, Hopefully the crack then goes along that control line that we've put in place. Okay. The idea of the nice decorative control line, again, is to hide that crack from being visible because at the end of the crack, it will still look like a, a nice joint has occurred um, in the slab. So it's one of the ones there. And then you've got the dowel joint as well where you uh, use it to join two slabs together that again may need to expand or will expand and contract. And so you need to allow for that so you have one end is secured in and the other end is uh, lubricated and able to move in and out um, as the concrete expands and contracts. So we think about the tools and materials that are required for the placement of the concrete. We've got the formwork and joint tools and materials, so the actual formwork, the pegs, the expansion foam, plastic membrane, sheeting, the edges and joiners, mallets, builder squares, straight edge, spirit level. So we've got all those tools just for preparing the formwork and joints. And then for the actual placement of the concrete, we actually need the materials, the ingredients of concrete. We need the reinforcement bars and the associated reinforcement materials, bar chairs, tie wire, et cetera. We need the placing material, uh, placing tools, so wheelbarrows, shovels, buckets, the concrete mixer, the vibrating poker to compact it, and the floats and the trowels uh, to help us finish that concreting off. Okay, so, they're the tools and materials that are required. Your JSA documentation should include all of these, in addition to any that I've forgotten from my list. Okay? So make sure that they are included in your JSA documentation so that you know to bring them to the job site when we get to the practical laying of the concrete slab. Here I've got another video for you. Now this is, um, this is for you to watch at home prior to coming to our practical where we place the concrete. Obviously I'll be coaching you along the way when we place it, but I'd like you to have a basic understanding so if you click on this image, I've shared the link with you. It takes you to a website, The Family Handyman. Um, and it's a great tutorial on 
uh, the processes that are being used. And you'll see in this particular application, this is again slab on ground, so there's no plastic membrane, there's no bar chairs. Um, so it's a little bit more of an informal slab that's being used, but the processes they talk you through are very relevant to what we'll be doing. There is an essentially eight step process, and that's directly from that video that I just showed you, okay, in that previous slide. You start by preparing the site, you prepare the formwork, you pack in a, a firm solid base where required, reinforce it when required with steel bar, you get your site ready for the concrete truck. So you actually need to make sure that you've got a planned path for the concrete truck to come in. You know where it's going to be placed. If it can't get to the slab, you've got your wheelbarrows ready for the concrete truck to arrive. And you've got a couple of people ready to do the running of the, of the wheelbarrows back and forth between the pouring point and the truck. You've then got the concrete being placed into the formwork. It gets uh, flattened and compressed, uh, compacted, sorry, um, into its position floated and troweled for its smooth finish. And then there's the cleanup process around that. I'm going to, at this point, focus now on the finishing of the slab. Okay, the finishing is that process of um, getting the final, final face of your slab. There are a few different finishes we talk about and um, sometimes we just float the finish and we have a nice smooth concrete top. Those sorts of slabs might be really good for car parks, okay, where you want to um, have a nice smooth polished concrete, for example. But if we're talking about footpaths or outdoor, outdoor uh, slabs where we're trying to decrease the likelihood of people slipping over, then we need to actually add imperfections to the surface to increase the grip that people have. We usually do this with a broom finish. Now, broom fish finishes are very common for uh, slip resistant finishes. Basically, just after the concreting, leveling, and troweling has been done, we then go across with a broom and create little straight ridges that go across the width of the slab to increase the uh, number of ridges, which therefore help with traction control when it's wet. This is really common. If you look at the footpath outside your house, um, you're probably going to see a broom finish. The other finish that's really common uh, for footpaths and for large slabs is the stipple finish. The stipple finish is basically where someone goes around and makes these little circular ridges, okay? And that helps to give you traction from all directions, okay? This might be particularly for a large playground area as opposed to um, a footpath where people are walking in one direction. If people are walking multiple directions, you might use the stipple device, which is able to help you um, in multiple directions of tra traction, okay? The stipple device that you use, it looks a bit like a float, but it's got the ridge, uh, ridge formation um, in it. You can have different depths of the ridges, so um, you would use a different stipple device to change the depth, and the amount of depth you have in your stipple device obviously increases or decreases the traction. A sponge finish is um, effectively another good slip resistant finish, and it's where you dab the surface with a sponge or a sponge float, to roughen the surface and it creates little pointy bits, okay, because you're sponging upwards, it pulls the surface slightly up, uh, creating little pointy bits in the uh, surface of the slab, again, helping to increase the, uh, helping to increase the traction on the slab. The other option to help with a similar finish to a sponge is instead of using a magnesium float or a steel float, to actually use only a timber float because the timber float naturally draws and pulls the surface, creating those natural sort of textures across the top. It should be compacted before you do the textured finish. Okay? So you, you would still actually do a steel trowel finish to get it nice and smooth and compacted. And then you go back across with the wood float to help get that textured finish or with a sponge um, where required. Now, the finishes may not always look identical when you're using sponges because a lot of it will depend on the sands that you use in the mixture. Okay, so um, if you're using a really coarse sand, you'll get a different uh, sponge finish to if you're using a, a, a fairly fine sand. The last, of the, uh, the last of the finishes we've got here is just plain troweling or floating. Um, once it's been screeded, we use the, the steel trowels, we use the magnesium floats, the bull floats, et cetera, 
to go through and get a really nice smooth finish. Basically, we get a flat steel blade to push the concrete and pull the concrete to smoothen it out in the best possible way. Um, the idea here is we can either use power trowels in large applications or where, where it's a smaller application, like a small piece of a footpath, um, a hand trowel would be totally suitable. Okay. If you want more information, there's actually a, a great resource here um, from the Cement Australia website um, where they can actually show you some of the different technical information around um, the finishing techniques on concrete slabs. So my last my last point here in this particular lecture is in defects that exist in concrete slabs. There are some known defects. Because we know that they exist, we can actually try to identify them as much as possible or minimize them before they occur. We do this in, um, we do this in a few ways. Firstly, plastic shrinkage. Plastic shrinkage causes cracks in the surface of your concrete slab. It sometimes can cause your slab to go a little bit flaky where little, the bits of the surface start to flake away. The reason this happens is because your concrete slab usually dries too fast. So you've got a whole heap of moisture sitting at the bottom of the slab so it doesn't crack, it dries quite normally. But the top section dries too fast and cures um, unevenly causing it to crack. Now, this happens quite often if you concrete on an extremely hot day or extremely sunny day where all of the bleed water is evaporated out very quickly and can be avoided by spraying some additional water or a, a curing agent, a okay, chemical to slow down the curing process, onto the slab to help slow it down. Quite often when we're talking about slab applications, um, you'll hear people say, oh, just spray it with water. Well, too much water can damage your slab, so there is a fine line. Um, but to increase the strength of the slab, you want it to slow down the curing process. So for this, you might go across once or twice a day a really light sprinkling of water just to add the moisture back into the surface so it can be reabsorbed into the slab to account for the amount of bleed water that has evaporated. Some of the other options that people use here is they quite often will um, put a tarp over top of the slab while it dries to stop it from being able to evaporate. Okay? Both of these are totally suitable depending on what you're doing. Um, but you do need to be aware that plastic shrinkage can occur, it does occur, and it makes your uh, concrete look terrible and can actually uh, change the strength slightly. The second type of defect that's very common is a settlement cracking. Settlement cracking are really deep cracks and it's usually caused by, um, if you have a look at the diagram we've got here, see these reinforcement bars. Basically, the concrete has split where the reinforcement bar is and these two edges of the uh, valley have sort of dried up and they haven't, they haven't joined back together, so they've separated and then they've dried out, preventing them from joining back together. This quite often happens when maybe a piece of aggregate falls from the surface during the vibrating process, compacting process, falls down and drags the surface um, can be caused by the slab not being mixed properly, maybe being a little bit too watery. Um, so all of the heavy particles, the aggregates and the reinforcement bars stick to the bottom and the watery parts sit to the top and sort of splits them apart. Okay, so that's what we need to consider. Additional documentation linked in here if you want to know more information about how to avoid it. But we want to try and work at how we distinguish them. The sediment cracks, the cracks, usually follow exactly where the reinforcement bars are. So you're usually going to have either a grid of cracks or nice consistent rows of cracks, okay? So it follows the pattern usually of the restraining element, so those reinforcement bars. Sometimes it can be caused by the aggregate particles as well. During the finishing process, you've got to try and cover those gaps up, control it before the uh, concrete goes too plastic, um, too set and um, it should be fine. The difference in the um, how to distinguish plastic shrinkage from sediment cracking, basically they are random. They might be parallel to each other. They might be all sorts of different lengths, 25 millimeters to two meters even, um, but they're usually around about the 300 to 600 millimeter long sort of length, so long, long length. They don't particularly follow the pattern of the 
um, reinforcement bars. So they're not going to be in a perfect little grid, for example, um, but there will be a couple of them sitting closely to each other, running parallel because they've all dried out consistently and the concreting has sort of shrunk up and that's why we call it plastic shrinkage. So that's the end of today's uh, lecture on the placement of concreting. Um, we're now pretty much ready to go out and do our concrete placement. The last thing we have left to do is the cleanup process, and that cleanup process is in the next lecture. So thanks very much, and look forward to seeing you during the next video.